Greetings, fam. On November 10th, 2016, President-elect Donald Trump met with President Obama. And if Donald looked a little bit shaken after he left that meeting, I would think that one of the things he might have been experiencing is a bit of job stress. Now, job stress is often defined as a mismatch between the capabilities of the worker and the demands of the job. After hearing President Obama describe exactly what the job of president involved, President-elect Trump might have, just for a moment, wondered whether he was up for the incredible demands of this job. After all, never in history of, of the United States has there been a person entering the White House with less political experience than Trump. That, my friends, is job stress. Um, this is not to say that he can't bridge the gap within a few months or maybe even a year or two of on-the-job training. To some extent, every incoming person and every person entering a new position, whatever it is, deals with the very same stress. It's kind of a sink or swim situation. Uh, still, maybe there was a moment when Trump realized just how much on-the-job training he would actually need as he sat there listening to President Obama describe exactly what the position involved. As for Trump, there's no reason why he wouldn't want to cultivate a private relationship with a former president, because as you can see here, Obama certainly did cultivate quite a few relationships with former U.S. presidents. And since whatever was said between the two was said in private, I'm just going to throw out there my guess of at least 10 things President Obama told President-elect Trump. And if he didn't tell him these things, well, maybe he should have. Let's start with number one, remember the Alamo. Now, this is interesting because, you know, everyone knows uh, Donald Trump's stance on uh, Latinos and in particular on Mexicans. So that phrase, remember the Alamo, is in reference to an event that happened at 5 a.m. on March 6, 1836, when the Mexicans stormed the Alamo. By dawn, the Mexicans had taken the Alamo. Women, children, and slaves were taken from the fort. So too was a small group of six captured rebels, and they were all taken to General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, who commanded their execution. Every rebel fighter had been killed. 600 of the Mexican troops had also died in the battle. A slave known to history only as John was the lone male who lived to tell the provisional rebel government what had happened at the fort. That's interesting. They, they, the Mexicans, they spared the black slave and he was the one who, who um, was able to then tell everyone um, what happened at the Alamo. And so that, that's where that term comes from. Number two, he might have told him, he who laughs last, laughs best. Now, I'm not quite sure of the origin of this, but I've seen it uh, attributed to Confucius. And what it simply means is that the person who has the last laugh is actually the winner. So sometimes we, we think we are victorious in something and it's just a matter of time before we're no longer rejoicing and the person who, um, who didn't uh, uh, revel in our triumph is now rejoicing. Okay, number three, everyone is entitled to be stupid, but some abuse the privilege. Um, this goes without saying, uh, Donald Trump made a lot of really stupid comments during his candidacy, but apparently there were enough people who um, were with him on the matter that, um, I don't want to say they were equally stupid, but you go figure. Okay, number four, be nice to people on your way up because you will need them on your way down. And this is something that um, people who have not suffered in this lifetime, they usually do not have any sympathy or concern for those who do. And it's, it's them who suffer the worst 
when calamity falls upon them because they don't know how to deal with it. Those of us who have suffered in this lifetime, we pretty much get a what they call a thick skin. So we can deal with stuff a lot better than those who don't know how to deal with it because they never have. It's the same sort of analogy as with job experience. It's like once you know what to do, you just do it. But if you don't know and you're hit with something new, it can be a little stressful or in some cases very stressful. Okay. You're on, number five, you're only young once, but you can be immature forever. And this is something that a lot of people, um, it goes right over their head. But the fact of the matter is I know some old, silly, immature people that just, if you close the door or if you close your eyes, you would think there were children in the room when you see how some old people act. So yes, you can be immature forever. Number six, there is a thin line between genius and insanity and you, Mr. Trump, have erased it. And this again goes to his, um, it's almost like Donald Trump has uh, some sort of Tourette's. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. I'm sure some of you are. But Tourette's syndrome is a syndrome that makes people blurt out inappropriate comments without any control or any um, ability to stop it. And it, in today's generation, they call it um, not having a filter. Okay, so I would attribute that to Mr. Trump in many cases um, when he is publicly speaking. Okay, and then uh, number seven, you are living proof that dreams really come true. And so do nightmares. So a lot of us, for a lot of us who didn't vote for him and who didn't want to see him get in office, this is a nightmare. Because he, it's not, and me as a black person, I am especially concerned because I know how he feels about us. Forget you know, all of you black people, look at the tweets. There, there's a, I'm going to put a tweet up here now where he's talking about how we are responsible, blacks and Latinos, for most of the crimes. And that's simply not true. We are responsible for most of the crimes that get publicity. But unless it's a mass serial killer, most white crimes are shoved under, you know, the table. They're not talked about. And um, you, have, you have white people killing people. You have white people that go into these uh, movie theaters and colleges and, and shoot everybody. I mean, everybody commits crime, all races. You've got Chinese criminals. You've got, um, you know, all sorts of people. So that's very unfair for him to make that statement as if it's only us. Okay, so um, number eight. A lot of people get a monkey off their back in order to make room for an elephant. Now, I'm going to break this down just for those of you, and I'm sure it's only a few of you that don't get what I mean. The term a monkey on your back is usually in reference to some type of habit or something that is annoying and troublesome, but you carry it around with you because you have to, because you can't get rid of it. And so what I'm saying in this particular analogy is that he's gotten rid of it, but now he has taken on an elephant, something even bigger than the monkey. And it is very likely in summation that Donald has bitten off more than he can chew. I believe the only reason that he entered the race in the first place was just to prove that he could win. Now, I never read the whole book, <coughs> but I've read quotes out of the book. And remember, in his book, The Art of the Deal, and I'm going to quote him here. He says, my style of deal making is quite simple and straightforward. I aim very high, and then I just keep pushing and pushing and pushing to get what I'm after. Sometimes I settle for less than I sought, but in most cases, I still end up with what I want. I wasn't satisfied just to earn a good living. I was looking to make a statement. I was out to build something monumental, something worth a big effort. Now, this book was obviously written long before he won the presidency, but with that type of mindset, 
This is a person that's just used to accumulating toys. It's like um, the the um, who who is who is the um, I forget the quote exactly, but it's in reference to the boy who has all the toys. So he's he's the boss. He's he's the man, and I think that. Donald, for whatever he's lacking in his personal um, accomplishments, he makes up for in his professional accomplishments. And so what is the highest office in the nation? President. And this is something that he sat down one day and decided he would accomplish. And he did. So now that he has it, sometimes um, what, what you... Um, aim for and, and wish to accomplish, and I'm going to get a little bit more into that, it, it's actually not what you had, um, had anticipated that it would be. You, you went after this thing, you fought diligently for it, but once you got it, you realize that the journey to the destination was a lot more fun than actually arriving. Um, and then number nine is let's agree that some days we are the pain and some days we are the ass. And that is self-explanatory. Um, Donald, when he gets in there, he will find that some days he will indeed be under a lot of pressure and pain. And then other times the people will see him as the ass. And then I think the final thing that um, President Obama may have said to Donald Trump is, it is time I stepped aside for a less experienced and less able man. So those are the 10 things that I think that um, if Barack Obama didn't say it to Donald Trump, then he should have because all we can do now at this point is wait and see. Um, but, um, you know, and, and pray. And pray and hope for the best. And so that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to pray and hope for the best. Lord, we've got a new president. You know that because nothing is done. People uh, think that we are in charge. But we're not, Lord. You're in charge. So you knew before he got in here that this would be the outcome. And... Um, we pray for your protection, Lord. We pray that maybe um, now that this man has achieved the coveted um, brass ring that he was grasping for, that perhaps he will uh, soften his attitudes towards minorities and not do anything rash. Um, Lord, I know that you've been giving me... Um, You've been giving me confirmations on things and, and the Holy Spirit has been pressing upon me some things that um, for weeks and weeks and weeks I've been given this uh, sense that this man will cut a lot of programs that help the poor. I sense that he will eliminate the Section 8 um, program and that many people will wind up homeless in the streets because they're unable to pay their rent without the subsidy. I am sensing that he will put a cap on the welfare system, Lord. Um, I am sensing that he will eventually do away with public housing, Lord. All of these things have been um, given to me and I want to tell the people to prepare to start saving, to spend wisely, because once these programs are cut, and there's more, I, I, there's more that I've been given. I've, I've been given visions of people in these FEMA camps and these FEMA shelters and, and people who once were able to live and come and go freely in these locked camps where they have to check in and sign out and sign in and observe curfews and the loss of freedom of a lot of people. Lord, I just see this all coming to pass. 
And I pray that you will help the people to realize that this is the time the, that we're entering and come January they're going to be it'll be slow but it'll it will come excuse me I also sense the mark of the beast coming where people will not be able to buy or sell unless they get the mark of the beast and I believe this will be another way that the government will control the people's finances. We will be under the government's uh, jurisdiction as to when we get our money and how we spend it. And um, there will be many collapses in various banking institutions where people will even lose that which they have. And those who are comfortable right now will become very uncomfortable when they do not know how they will pay their bills or feed their children, Lord. And I, I thank you, Lord, for the visions of these things. But I also ask in Jesus' mighty name that you protect us. And, and you said for those of us who love and worship you that we do not have to worry and so I'm, I'm having faith. I have faith. I claim it now in your name that we will survive this. And there is a greater outcome on the other side, Lord. And I look forward to it. I thank you and I bless you in Jesus' mighty name.